I don't remember if last time you recall or not, but I mentioned that, whoops, let me get me up there. I mentioned that we would start talking about forces today. So um, I know that's moving ahead, but um, yeah, let's, um, let's just go ahead and start with the screen share and take it from there. It's always weird when we start a new topic. There's so many different ways to start it. So, ah, not relative velocity. Sorry about that. Oops, going the wrong way. Oh, I just, oh, sorry. Oh, my gosh. I thought I had that queued up. My fault. Oh, my gosh. Sorry about this. It happens. There we go. Okay. Now, the big picture here. Forces are vectors. They have magnitude and direction. So, again, forces are vectors. One of the things that we've done already, we spent all this time learning about vector math. We did 2D motion, where we talked about splitting things into the I hat part and the J hat part, the X column and the Y column, delta Y and delta X all the time. So a very, very brief picture of forces is this. We're going to learn about a thing called Newton's laws, and one of them is Newton's second law. And that's going to say, and I, I'm just going to put it up here. Actually, let's go to the whiteboard here. We'll come back to this. But um, so this is on page... 83 in your workbook if you want to have that open when I talk, okay? That said, let's try doing this slightly different than the last class. So I'll use the whiteboard and you never know something different might come out. All right. Oh, that's what we're going to be doing by the end of today. So Newton's second law. I know you might be saying, why am I starting with the second? Just give me some, some latitude here. Newton's second law says that the sum of forces, these are vectors, is equal to mass times acceleration. Now, this symbol here is the, the summation symbol in mathematics or sigma. Maybe you've seen it from like I equals one to N or something like that of F sub I. So it, uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, let me just write the words here. Um, you could think of it like force one plus force two plus force three, all the different forces, let's say there happen to be three in one case, is mass times acceleration. So this is one way to think about it. It's basically just add up all the forces acting on an object, and that should equal its mass times its acceleration. Okay? Uh, sometimes we just say... Net force equals ma, where net force is basically all of that. Or you could say the sum of forces. So these are all the different ways one as might hear Newton's second law stated. Okay, you either add up all the forces one at a time and that gives you mass times acceleration. Now, why should we care about this at all? Well, let's think about this. If you can understand, let's say you know there are several different forces acting on an object and you can learn about them. Great. <clears throat> We could take those forces and add them all up and figure out the acceleration. Then we could take this acceleration and stick it into kinematics. And then you could figure out how objects move. So the idea is we see that forces will relate to acceleration, which relates to motion. And that helps us kind of get a full picture of how objects are moving around and Once you could make predictions, maybe you could design better equipment. Uh, for example, let's say you knew how you wanted something to move. Well, that would tell you how much acceleration you need. So maybe that in turn, you could work this backwards and figure out how much force you need. So maybe this would help you design a better automobile or a better airplane or a better slingshot or better something, right? You'd figure out, well, I need this much force to get that much acceleration so it moves this way. Uh, and these are the ways that well, that's kind of the big picture of why we might care about this. And you can see that we're dangerously close to doing useful physics here, right? Now, to be honest today, we're gonna to work on the very basics and just trying to understand these equations very simply, but that's where this big picture is headed. So um, I'll pause for a second. Are there any questions about this big picture that, I, that you have? Anything you want? We've got plenty of time today for questions. No, 
All right. And remember, at any time, you guys can interrupt me and throw something in the chat, or you can ask Memo. Um, and actually, I forgot to make Memo a, a, a co-host. Let me do that really quick. There you go, Memo. Sorry about that. So I'm reading the chat question. So is that why gravity itself is not a force? Wait a minute here. Uh, sorry, it disappeared on me. Because it depends on the mat. Okay, so uh, Jacob brings up a good question. Um, he's talking about um, uh, the force due to gravity. So let's let's do a simple, very very simple picture here, and we'll go back to that handout in a minute. Let's say you had a floor, and here is a box, and the box is sitting on the floor. Okay, so yeah, it's basically just this, right? The marker is sitting on my hand or the box is sitting on the floor, something like that. What's one force on this marker? Or what's one force on that box? Go ahead and unmute or throw it in the chat, either way. Well, I would say gravity, but- Okay, gravity. Gravity is not a force. Gravity is a force. Gravity is not an acceleration. And that's what I wanted to try and get at. So gravity pulls you down. Gravity is one force. It acts at the center of the box, assuming it's uniformly distributed. So we would say this is a gravitational force. Now, that's really long. I don't want to wait that long when I write that every time. So I could just call that a weight force. That was a terrible joke. Now, I don't like writing lots of symbols. So a lot of times people say this is just W for weight. Okay, so these are different things. The gravitational force or your weight. So that's all true. Now be careful. It turns out the magnitude of this is mass times G. G is not a force. And maybe that's what you were thinking. G, this is not gravity. Gravity is a force. So this is the magnitude of the acceleration due to gravity. Jacob, is that kind of getting towards your question a little bit? Yeah. It's just, so, oh, yeah. go ahead. Sorry. I, mean, I don't really have a question. I'm just like trying oh. to trying just to figure it out in my head. Gotcha, yeah. yeah. Staying yeah. active, talking, and yeah, keeping the brain going. Got it. Okay, so now, what holds this box up? Or like this marker in my hand? Some force is holding it up. It's not falling down, right? Well, that force, in general, in physics, we're going to call this normal force. Okay, so going back to this screen share here, as a physicist, normal does not mean uh, like, hey, you're a normal person. You're pretty, you're pretty normal uh, or, or abnormal. What I mean by normal is the mathematical definition, which means perpendicular. So I'll write perp there for perpendicular. So normal in mathematics means perpendicular. Now I want to be clear here. Read this carefully. The symbol for the force is not n. The symbol for the magnitude of the force is N. That's going to be uh, the force that acts at an interface between two surfaces. It acts perpendicular to the surface. So let me go back to that here. Uh, let me stop that screen share. So the idea here is, from a physics perspective, I'm running out of room here. I'm trying to draw these two arrows the same size. Now, in this case, I know this is boring, but that's basically what's happening with this marker, right? Gravity's pulling it down. Gravity is a force. Normal force is supporting it. What is the acceleration of this marker if I could keep my hand perfectly still? Zero. Zero. 
So what we see is we can actually bring this back here to our equation. Remember I said Newton's second law said the sum of forces is equal to mass times acceleration. Okay, well, let's look at this one. Now we've gotta be careful here. Notice these over here have arrows on it. So normal force has a vector on it. This is the magnitude, this is the direction. Together, this magnitude and that direction make a vector. So the normal force vector is the magnitude plus the arrow. I don't know if that makes sense here. The gravitational force is its magnitude, its weight, plus the direction towards the center of the Earth. So now, don't think too much here. Let me just walk you through here. Uh, I think, uh, I, I forget who that was, but somebody just told me that the acceleration was equal to zero. I forgot who, my bad. Right, it's not moving when I just hold it there. Okay, so let's see what happens when we plug all this crap into here. And just to make this stand out a little bit, I wanna point out something here. This is the acceleration vector that relates to this. Now, what is one force that we have here? How about normal force? The magnitude is N, and then the direction is positive j-hat. So it's n in the j-hat. The weight has size mg, where it's mass times our old friend 9.8 meters per second squared. Remember, this number is positive. The arrowhead gives us a negative sign, right? This is going opposite the y direction, so that would be a negative mg in the j-hat. And all this should equal mass times zero. And I guess I could just to make it easy, let's say it's zero in the J hat. It's also zero in the I hat. What does every term have in it here? What's well, going to drop out? Um, J hat. Uh huh. So just rewriting this and zero times mass, isn't that just going to be zero? So notice you get N minus mg equals zero. Now I know this seems very, very cheesy, but we got to start simple just to get used to the symbols, okay? So notice out of this, N is equal to mg. And then I want to be careful here. What does this symbol mean? Do you remember? Uh, the, the magnitude of the normal force. I could tell you're learning physics because I was trying to trick you to forget the magnitude, but he didn't forget. Did everybody catch that? He remembered to say the magnitude, and that's what I was looking for. The magnitude of the normal force should equal the magnitude here of the weight, right? And so it's not that N equals mg, it's that N equals mg. What do I mean by that? The normal force vector is equal to the opposite of the weight vector, but the normal force magnitude is equal in size to the weight magnitude. And so we see there's a big difference here. Not from a practical standpoint, many of our equations we're going to work out and we're going to use the magnitudes all the time. Now I know I'm jumping ahead a lot here, but um, let's go back and Let's try and look at the screen share and get used to what I'm going to use for some of the symbols and just kind of go through that really quickly so that we can do this problem again and understand it at a deeper level or maybe variations on it. Um, unless there's any questions while well, I have that up. If you have questions, that comes first. Well, 
Well, at, at first I was thinking that normal force is gonna equal 9.8 meters per second at, at this point at this point, but then it does it, right? Because it's considering mass. So when you first started drawing it up, I was like, well, that's easy. Normal force is just going to be 9.8 going up. Mm. And, but, but because it's involving mass then yeah. normal force is not 9.8. 9 right, right. Yeah, uh, and actually, let me go to screen share right now because this is, relates to what he was just saying. I think that was Esteban there. So look at the units. And I just want to point out, let's look at this gravity force. Gravity is a force. And so kind of going back to what Jacob was saying, remember, G is not gravity. G is the magnitude of your acceleration due to gravity if you're in free fall, right? So if you drop something off a table or something, that's going to be its acceleration. Or if you throw a ball in the air, the second it leaves your hand, that's its acceleration magnitude ah what is this crap all right hold on a second oh my gosh come on get rid of whatever that is okay so um where was i shoot i got distracted i need my annotation there we go okay so now this is uh I, i'm bringing this up because of this line right here an easy way to remember the unit is to think this the units of force are the units of mass times gravity which is kind of what esteban was just talking about i think now think about this m times g what are the units of mass kilograms right and then what are the units of g meters per second squared now sometimes we just call this a Newton, which is a capital N. So notice this is what I'm showing you right here. The units for force are called Newtons. And a Newton is essentially a kilogram meter per second squared or an MG. And now I should be careful. The units of force are the units of MG. So that's the units. And that's a trick where you can use that to tell the difference between G, which is a acceleration magnitude, and gravity, which is a force, which is mass times G. Okay, Mass and weight are two different things. I like to think of it like this. Mass, well, let, me get, let me get rid of the screen share for a sec. Mass is the amount of stuff you have. So the number of molecules you have in your body is your mass. That's the amount of stuff you have. Weight is how much gravitational force that amount of mass causes on different planets. So on different planets, you have different weights. If you go to the moon, you weigh one sixth of what you weigh on the earth. So um, Mass doesn't change when you go from one planet to another. The amount of crap you have in your body, you know, the your number of molecules you have is not changing as you go to different places. Now, if you really, if you go and climb a really tall mountain, it turns out gravity is ever so slightly weaker up there. Or if you go to Colorado, where it's a slightly higher in elevation, but maybe there's a lot more uranium deposits, that could change things in the fourth or fifth fig of your weight um, so it turns out actually the gravitational force changes in the third sig fig as you go to different places around the planet um, so uh, but for the most part your weight is not changing as you go to different spots on earth and if so it's only in the third or fourth sig fig that said weight and mass are not exactly the same um, now this begs the question if you ever go to the grocery store they might label things in kilograms or grams. And you're like, well, that's not a weight, that's a mass. Okay, but on the Earth's surface, most people would get the same weight to three sig figs for that box of cereal. And since they're only giving you one or two sig figs anyways, eh, it's good enough. So just be aware, um, weight and mass are not the same thing. Um, any questions about that? Mm. I put some ice cream in my coffee. Mm, it's pretty good. Now I'm really going to be ready to party. Okay.
<clears throat> you guys haven't tried that, put some cold coffee in and put an ice cream ball in there. It's pretty good. Living the dream. Let's get back to here. Um, all right. What are some units we have here? We got this normal force magnitude is lowercase n and tension. That's like the, the force in a cable or a string. So that magnitude is going to be T. Gravity is going to be MG. So sometimes people call it lowercase w. Friction. That's going to be a lowercase f. And then sometimes there's going to be a push or a pull. And what do I mean by that? Um, let's read this little asterisk here. In a lot of problems, they'll say, a force with magnitude f is applied. Uh, that's basically somebody pushing on a block or pulling on a block or something like that. So these first forces are basically what we're going to use all the time in this class. And being straight with you, this one, friction, we cover in chapter six, okay? So we're gonna discuss friction when we get to chapter six. Um, so <clears throat> um, those are the main symbols we're gonna use. Let me just scroll down here. There's other forces, springs, uh, this gets complicated. There's electric forces, there's magnetic, and there's the strong force, the weak force, all kinds of different things. Let's go through this quick uh, note down here and see if there's anything useful in here that I forgot to say, okay? So lowercase t is gonna be time, uppercase t is gonna be tension, lowercase n is normal force, magnitude, uppercase n are the units of force. I got this one already, lowercase and uppercase, uh, push and pull. And then this note, let's not even worry about that. Let's worry about that in 161. Going forwards, we briefly mentioned these laws, so let's look at these. There is a third one, but I'm gonna talk about that another day. So Newton's first law, let's actually talk and let's talk about Newton's second law first. This is the one I was telling you about. This is another way of saying it. Basically, if you want to know an object's acceleration, add up all the forces on it and divide by its mass. Now, um, I want to be careful here. Mass and the term inertia are synonymous in this class. So if you've ever heard the phrase, uh, oh, they've got a lot of inertia going into the game or whatever. Or whatever. So inertia. I want you to think mass. Mass, inertia are almost perfectly interchangeable. So the more mass or stuff you have, the more you resist changes in velocity. And this is a common misconception people have. Force relates to acceleration. Okay, acceleration relates to motion, but it's not directly your motion right velocity is which way you are moving and how fast we do not say sum of force. let me just write it like this the sum of forces is not equal to mass times velocity that's just not true and this was a common misconception of students for all time and human beings we're so used to thinking about things moving and we know that you need force to move things. So we think force and motion are directly related. And I would just say they're related through this acceleration term, not through a velocity term. So this is horrible, never do that. And students may think they understand that, but every once in a while I'll get you and I'll ask a concept question and be like, ah. So said another way, the more mass you have, the more you resist changes in velocity. Acceleration is your change in velocity. Okay, let's get that up on the whiteboard and look at it for a second. Let's look at this equation. Now, I know that you guys do not, you're not required to know calculus for this class. That said, I know a lot of you are doing calculus right now. So I'm gonna just go ahead and sneak in a little calculus because sometimes that helps students understand things better. 
Does anybody know how acceleration relates to velocity with calculus? It's okay if you don't. Uh, it's, it's the, the, it's the derivative. derivative. It's that, right? It's the change in velocity over change in time. So it's approximately equal to If you use a small enough delta t, this approximation is extremely good. So check this out. I'm just going to rewrite this. How about I say approximately equal to? And so I just wanted to emphasize what Newton's second law is saying here. If you know something's force, notice I could solve this for delta v the change in velocity would be net force divided by mass times delta t. So again, I divide through by the mass and I multiply here and then I switch the sides. I divide through by mass, force over mass, that's this first term, multiply by t and then I switch the sides. So notice Force is not really talking about your velocity. It's talking about how your velocity changes. Oh, and there's a chat. Let me get to that. Okay. And remember, anybody, you can ask memo questions anytime you want. You can unmute and ask me questions anytime you want. Whatever you got. Okay. Um, and, and this kind of gives you an idea how you would write a computer program you write a computer program that figures out this upper term, the net force, and maybe it's mass. And then what you do is in a computer program, you pick a very small number for delta T. When you do that, that will give you how much the velocity changes. So then what you do is you say, okay, I'm gonna plug in all these numbers, plug in a small amount of time, figure out how the velocity changes. Once I know the new velocity, I could figure out how far it moves and in what direction. After it does that, I recompute the forces. Maybe they've changed a little bit because maybe a spring has stretched or maybe it's going a little faster or slower. So there's more or less drag, whatever. I recalculate the forces, do this, move another tiny little time step, figure out the next change in velocity, let the object move, recompute the forces and do this over and over and over again. And the idea is you could actually do this. And if you cut your time step, steps up small enough, you can always use that constant acceleration kinematics from chapter two and four. So it's really powerful, right? You figure out the forces on an object, multiply by this, get the change of velocity, do kinematics, repeat, repeat, repeat. And computers can do that very efficiently and make all these complicated simulations. And you can understand something that way. Um, all right, so far so good. Any questions about that? And you can put them in the chat or you can just ask or, or anything. I think that's cool. Okay. I'm going to go one step further here. I know this is getting way out there, but I, I'm excited. Now it turns out, let me, um, let me go like this. And you don't have to remember all this stuff, but it just gives you a feeling of where we're going with physics. Exactly, Jacob, exactly. So here's the idea. I'm gonna put this up here. And now if M is a constant, I could bring that inside, right? Because you could bring a constant inside a derivative this would be the derivative of mass times velocity. Mass times velocity is a quantity called momentum in physics. Now, we're not going to do momentum until chapter 9. But my reason for saying it is this. It turns out this equation for force is even better. The change in momentum over the change in time. And it turns out this equation is valid 
in special relativity, when things are moving close to the speed of light, this one up here is not. And so this is actually a more general way to write Newton's second law. And we'll get into this more when we take a physics 161 class. That said, all you need to know for this class. So this was just to kind of let you see there is going to be some cool stuff eventually. For us, we're going to focus on this version of Newton's second law. Force, mass, and acceleration. And we're going to just try and work on this type of problem. Um, th those other ones are great if the mass changes, right? Like a rocket uses up some of its fuel. You need that last equation that I just erased. But this one is good for things like blocks that have a constant mass. So we're going to start with that and keep it easy. All right. Um, now, the reason I did that one and spent so much time on it is look what happens if A goes to zero. You get Newton's first law. Newton's first law is a subset of Newton's second law. Now, I want you to be careful, people. A lot of people, when they think of Newton's first law, they just say this. An object in motion stays in motion, and they forget about the rest of the sentence. The rest of the sentence is hugely important. Objects don't always stay in motion. Objects don't always stay at rest. Objects in motion stay in motion if the net force is zero. So if sum of force equals zero, whoops, uh, if the net force equals zero, objects at rest stay at rest. Objects in motion stay in motion. So I just want to be clear it's very important that you know that this unless statement is involved in that. Now this non-zero net external force, or blah, 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 that's basically saying if this, then, uh, then that. So I'll pause for a second there and let the computer catch up. All righty. Um, if we were in class, I would be showing you some really cool demos to make this stick, but we're not. So what I'm going to try and do uh, is send you a video or two. Now, let me see. I want to make sure I have this up here. This is what it takes to make a class online. It sucks. Oh my gosh, come on. Oh my gosh, where is it? There we go. It's funny, no, even, even when I was in class, the videos still chop off my head, huh? That's funny. Um, I think that's the video. So, um, watch it later. Where are we? Oh, so um, the video I just sent you was an animation of this one. So normally when I do classes in person, I bring up some brave student who gets to smash this with a lead pipe uh, and, and just, just go crazy. And um, it's usually fun because we only have about 50% success rate. So that means half the time there's this giant mess of shattered glass and liquid all over the classroom. Um, this is kind of a fun old story here. They used to do this demo with circus ears. Um, and sometimes there's also the um, tablecloth trick. If you've ever seen that one, these are really fun. But to be honest, if we're not doing the demos, it's not worth spending all this time talking about them because it's just not as fun. Um, let me see if I... Was it 2018? No. Let's try 2017. No. Let's try 2016. 
Ah, geez, I don't know where it is. I can't find it right now. But I used to bring people up on stage and let them do the stuff. And I, I don't know where that video is. I, but that's all right. The tablecloth trick is pretty fun. Let's leave it at that. If I find it, I'll send it to you in an email. But um, there are some things that you might learn about inertia and impulse. So if you want to read this later and watch that video later, you could get at least a partial feel for this one. So sorry, class is online. It's uh, emergency mode. It's just not as good. Anyways, all right, let's... Um, it's sad, but what are you going to do? All right. I can't show you these demos. Let's, let's stop trying to do that because we can't do it well. Let's move on and try and at least learn the math of this, okay? So um, what I want to do is I want to look at these problems. And previously, we did a problem with the block that was sitting on the floor. And now I want to look at 5.3. And I want to point out this coordinate system here goes like this versus this coordinate system in a different type of scale, 5.4. And so I know this seems probably way too easy for you, but you better believe me that these problems get a lot more complicated quickly. It's important for physicists and engineers to understand different coordinate systems. I can't emphasize this enough. The reason that jumps out in my mind instantly is eventually objects are going to move in circles. And usually when objects move in circles, we have a coordinate system that moves around with the object in circular motion. And so if you wanna have any hope of understanding objects that are going in circles, you first need to be able to understand problems that have different coordinate systems. So that's why we're doing these two problems, even though they're nearly identical, okay? We're trying to see how coordinate systems affect things. Okay, now that said, let's start up here with this problem here, where this object is accelerating with magnitude A in the direction shown, okay? I'm gonna write this up on my whiteboard and get us out of here, all right? so. Okay, so what I wanna do right now is I'm gonna draw what's called a free body diagram. And I know I'm throwing a lot of stuff at you. It will get better eventually with practice. A free body diagram, sometimes we just say F, B, D because that's shorter, okay? So a free body diagram means draw one body or one object all by itself. So in this case, uh, going back to that picture, I see that we have this black sphere is going to be my object. That's my body. Now, what does a free body diagram mean? It means we're gonna draw that body or that object all by itself. So here is that. Next, we draw forces that act on it. So the F is not force body diagram, but that's a pretty good reminder. F makes, makes you think of forces. FBD, we're gonna draw a force. Somebody tell me one force acting on this object and I'll bring it back up so you can see it again. Give me one force acting on that black sphere in problem 5.3. Take a shot at it. Negative A? Uh, no, A is an acceleration. Gravity. Is accelerate, oh, so let me get Esteban. So watch out, is acceleration a force? Do they have the same units? No. We're missing the kilograms. No. Yeah, so it's not the same. It relates to it, but that is not a force. So I'm gonna draw that over here. So Esteban said acceleration needs to be involved. He's absolutely right. But it is not technically a force. It relates to the net force. More on that in a minute. Okay, and then I think it was Jacob just said gravity, right? Yeah. Which way does gravity pull on this black object? Downwards. Downwards. So negative. Yep. 
Now, um, let's just go right to there. What is the magnitude of that gravitational force? Do you remember? Oh, thanks, Memo. Uh, so it'll be mass times acceleration. So no. MA, no. Nope, it's M times. M times G? G. So that is your weight force. It's going to relate to the acceleration, but it's not the same. Let me ask you this. Is this object in free fall? Let's remind ourselves what free fall means. Free fall means gravity is the only force acting on it. For this black object that we, oh, whoops. Um, for this object that you see right here, is gravity the only force acting on it? Mm, no, because there's no the tension force. No, yeah, there's a tension force. So let me go, let me get out of here and go to here. Uh, Jacob, you just said there's a tension force. Which way does the tension force act? Uh, straight upwards. Yep. And so if gravity was the only force, then this acceleration would be G. Because there's more than one force here, we don't know that it's accelerating downwards with rate G. It's not in free fall. So you've got to be careful here. Weight is mass times G, whether you're accelerating or not. My weight does not change very much, no matter what I do. It's always big. <laughs> so yeah, no matter what I do, it couldn't be the ice cream in my coffee. I don't know. But yeah, um, sorry, I got distracted there. The fact is your weight is not changing unless you go to a different planet. That's always going to be mg. But your acceleration could be different depending on what forces are acting on you. Uh, is that good on that one, Jake? That's sneaky. Yeah, yeah. Right, right on. All right. Now, what do we know about this? This is actually a free body diagram now. We have shown the body by itself with forces acting on it. Only forces. I have not drawn the acceleration. Okay. Now, in this case, I'm going to try and go one step further. I want to write down Newton's second law. Now, I could even take this a step further. I could do this in the I hat, and I could do it in the J hat, right? A vector, I could write one equation for the I hat motion and one equation for the J hat motion because X motion and Y motion are independent. All right, so in this case, let's go over here. Uh, I'll do the X equation. This, let's say, sum of forces in the X direction should equal mass times acceleration in the x direction. So based off this picture, how much is this thing accelerating in the x direction? Zero. Zero. How many forces do I have in the x direction? <laughs> Zero. So this is extremely uninteresting in the x direction. It says zero equals zero. Okay. Let's try this in the J-hat direction now. In the J-hat direction, what do we get? What's one force acting vertically? Uh, so we got gravity, mg. Gravity. Okay, so mg. Now, according to this coordinate system, should it be a positive or negative J-hat term? Negative. So the idea is because this arrowhead and that arrowhead are opposite directions, we would write a negative, right? It's a negative J hat. We don't actually write the J hat because we know they're all going to cancel out. Next, what's another force? Somebody else in the vertical direction. Tension. Tension. According to this coordinate system, positive or negative? Positive. So I'm going to write that there. I could have written it afterwards. It doesn't matter. According to this, this is all equal to mass times, what do I put in for the acceleration? Negative A. 
negative A. It's not G because it's not in free fall. It's not positive A because these two arrows are opposite directions. So the magnitude of the acceleration is A. The direction is opposite my coordinate system. Got it? This is our first full free body diagram, and we've used Newton's second law, and we can now analyze and learn about the tension. Let's finish this out. I'm going to solve this for tension, and I just want to point out that you get tension. You could race me. Solve this for T. I got tension is mg minus ma. To be clear, m is mass, mg is weight, a is the rate that you accelerate. In this problem, let's think about this. Which one should be bigger? Should the tension be bigger or should the weight be bigger if this thing is accelerating downwards? What do you think? This thing weight. Is, uh, yeah, exactly. So I tried to draw this thing a little bit that way. I don't know if you could tell, but let's exaggerate this. We expect that the tension magnitude should be smaller than the weight magnitude. And as a result, the down arrows are bigger than the up arrows for the forces, and the net acceleration is downwards. The net force vector is downwards, so the acceleration is downwards. What do you think? Uh, any questions? So if the tension and mg were equal, then it would be no acceleration. Okay, so let me rephrase that another way. Under what circumstances will the tension equal the weight in terms of magnitudes? Or said another way, under what circumstances will the tension magnitude equal the weight magnitude? If, when do these two arrows equal in size? If what? If acceleration is zero? Exactly. So I'm going to, now I want you to think about being inside of an elevator. If you're standing on the first floor of an elevator and the elevator's not moving, eh, you feel like the, the elevator is supporting your full weight. Now, if the elevator is accelerating either upwards or downwards, all of a sudden you feel a different experience. You feel a different amount of force in the elevator. Your weight doesn't change but the force that's supporting you might change if the elevator is accelerating. I'm going to say a sentence that is incorrect, and I want you to figure out what is wrong. Okay? Again, I'm going to say something that's wrong. Listen carefully and see if you can pick it out. We expect that the tension should equal the weight uh, any time, oh, wait, wait, I got to think now. I got to be careful. Hold on. I'm, it's very difficult for me to say it incorrectly. So I got to give me a second. What did I want to say again? Shoot. Um, oh, I know. I got it. Here it is. Sorry. The tension will not equal the weight anytime this thing is moving. It's not about movement, it's about acceleration. Yes, and so you can see why I had trouble saying that. So remember that motion and acceleration are not the same thing. So give me an example, but the tension still equals the weight. Describe a scenario where the elevator is moving, but tension equals the weight. Uh, so I guess, so 
the elevator sort of it starts off and it gets up to speed and then stops accelerating so it just sort of keeps moving up and then it's going to be at that point it's just like staying constant so you're just going to feel normal like excellent that. so while the elevator is moving at constant speed you're still moving but your acceleration drops to zero and so this is what's happening in an elevator when you go up if you start here at the ground floor you accelerate for a little while and the tension is actually bigger than the weight think about it if you're accelerating now this is a little bit different this one was going downwards but let's say you were accelerating upwards to the second floor as you go upwards first you accelerate tension would have to be bigger to cause an upwards acceleration. Then you go at constant speed for a while. These two are equal because A equals zero. Then you slow down. When you slow down, tension is upwards, weight is downwards, acceleration is downwards. When acceleration is downwards, as you're moving upwards and slowing down, you feel a little less weight, but you still have all that weight. So your perception of weight is actually related to the support force, the force that is keeping you from falling down. Right. So uh, that's a very unusual thing. Um, let's take this to the absurd limit. Under what circumstances would you get no tension? Well, uh, I guess if maybe you're going, you're accelerating upward at the magnitude of gravity, like close, but that's not right. So let's think. He said, what if you're going upwards? He said, let's say you're accelerating up upwards with rate G. That's what you just said. If you're accelerating upwards, which force should be bigger? So te tension is zero when you're free. Hold up. Uh, yes, that's true, Esteban. You got it. But I want to get Jacob's question here. Jacob, does this make sense? If you accelerate upwards with rate G, doesn't T have to be bigger than MG? Otherwise, you wouldn't have an upward. Yeah. yeah. So, so what you're saying is, downwards with rate G, right? Hold on. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can see that in the equation too. If it was upwards with rate G, then it'd be T equals two mg. Mm -hmm. Trying to get there. Oh my gosh, come on. Sorry. Somewhere in here, give me just a second. There it is. So I'll put this, let me see if I can find this link. So you could watch that on your own uh, and you could see what happens to the scale reading when it's in free fall. Another way you could see this is if you take a two liter bottle and fill it up with water, then you poke a hole in it. You know the water is going to come pouring out, right? The water falls out. Now, if you climb up to the top of a ladder, then you poke the hole or you had your finger over the hole. And then right as you let go, none of the water will come out because all of the water is in free fall already with the entire bottle. And so none of it comes squirting out. And then, of course, as soon as it hits the pavement, it'll start splooshing everywhere. But yeah, there's some kind of interesting things you can see about that. So um, I don't know. Isn't that kind of fun? It's a little bit interesting, I hope. Um, and it's only going to get better, right? These are like the simple ones. So, so that, that's why, uh, so when free fall, that's why you feel weightless, right? Or they do those, uh, uh, what do you call it? When you're in free fall, yes, it makes you, you seem like there's zero weightless. gravity. Yeah. Yeah, you feel weightless, but you're not weightless. You still have weight. That's the force that's making you fall. So a long time ago when I was, oh, I wonder if I had that stupid picture here. No, I don't have it. So when I was um, a first, when I got first got hired at Hancock, there was a silly little grant. And um, it was for working in space or something a long time ago. And they'd asked everybody on campus that was involved with the grant if they had time to go to this weird vomit comet flight and everybody's like ah, i'm busy i'm busy i'm busy so they're like well you're the new guy you want to go i'll be like yeah so they they paid for me to fly to florida 
go in the vomit comet. It was so cool. And the, the vomit comet works. They have you fly in a, in a parabola. So it's like, um, yeah, it's the zero G flight. I was so lucky. Yeah. It's normally like $5,000. Plus they paid for my hotel to go there and I saw an alligator. It was really cool. But anyways, what they do is they launch the plane in a parabola, like it's in free fall. And so while the plane is going like this, you're floating around and you're in you're, right. You're weight. You're, you feel weightless and it's weird. The, the natural tendency is to start swimming, right? Because you're like, that's the only other time you feel kind of weightless in the world. But so they're like, please don't swim around the airplane. It's not going to do shit. So anyway, that's just kind of funny. Right. But you can't help it. You're like, ah, yeah. Anyways. And they had a video and I looked really stupid and I don't know where the video is now, but yeah, it's super cool. Um, Anyways, but yeah, so that's one way you could train astronauts. Another thing that they do for NASA, uh, this is a simplified version. They literally have a really tall elevator shaft. And it's, I think, a four-second drop. Now think about that. Four seconds is pretty far. If it, if it helps you remember it, it's the same distance from the Golden Gate Bridge to the, the water. I don't know why. I heard some weird NPR story about that one time, and they were saying, oh, it's four seconds. So, um, uh, Esteban, that would be different though, right? The fan that keeps you in the air is exerting a force on you. So if you were in an elevator that's dropping, you don't have that air resistance. And so you don't have, right. It's, it's a different situation. That would be somewhat similar in the sense of you're, you're not touching anything, but you're being supported with a fan force instead of a floor. So it's not quite the same. You, so, you see what I'm saying, Esteban? Yeah, yeah, I get what you're saying. Yeah, and I, so I, just, I pictured it because I was like, well, I guess it wouldn't feel the same. I've never been in either one, but yeah, the other one will feel weightless, and the other one will feel like you're just kind of like laying on a, on the floor. Yeah, yeah, and the weightless, right? People usually puke. So there was some lady that was next to me that puked all over. It was great. Um, that's why they call it the vomit comet. Yeah. So, anyways, yeah, that's always fun having to sit there strapped in. Oh, the other part is. During the vomit comet flight, you don't get anything for free. So they, they launch you this way. You get zero Gs for a while. But then think, when they have to go this way, you actually get almost. So you're like, oh, yeah. And so it's really intense, right? So you're just alternating between no gravity and massive gravity. And you're just like, oh. So that's what makes people puke. Yeah, it's, it, was, it was really cool. All right. Um, that said, let's get back to work and do one more problem here and see how it goes. Whoa, that's not what I want to do. I want to do this one. Let's see. I know this seems very easy, but let's do it anyways. Let's do the same problem with a different type of scale and a different coordinate system. So what I want you to do is I want you to write down the force equation without looking at my board. And I'm going to write it as well, and then we'll look at it together. Okay? So I'm just writing it down just like you are. Try to draw a free body diagram. Try to draw an FBD and draw the arrows and then write the force equations. Okay? So. And rather than draw the whole person, I'm just going to draw a black dot again. Okay, that's what I drew. So 
So notice this time I used an N because it's a normal force holding it up instead of a spring scale, which uses a tension. So that's one difference. Number two, the coordinate system is in a different orientation. And be careful here. Notice the following, just like I mentioned with Esteban earlier, acceleration is not a force. It does not go on the free body diagram. FBD stands for free body diagram, not force, but come on, we're talking about forces here. So that F kind of helps you remember that. Okay, I hope you all agree there's no point in doing the X direction for this problem. So I'm only going to do the J-hat parts. Right? Sum of force in the Y equals mass times acceleration in the Y. All right. Somebody tell me one force in the Y direction, and should it be positive or negative? Negative N. Negative N. Let's see. I have no idea. So he's saying N points up. Y points down. I agree. These two are opposite. Whoops. These two are opposite. That's why he gets a negative there. So going further, what's MG going to be? Positive or negative? Somebody else. Would it be a positive? Excellent. And then all this is equal to, is it MA or M negative A in this problem? Somebody else. Positive A. Yeah. Ah, good job. Nice. And so if you can do this, you could do this chapter. Now it's going to get tricky. There's going to start being sines and cosines and things at angles and, blah, 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 and five forces instead of just two. But if you could get the basics down of getting the signs right, you can get this job done. Now let's solve for the scale reading, okay? Solve this for N. You guys take a second to do it and I will too. Solve for N. I hope that's what you got. And if you're still working, take a second to finish it up. Ooh. So it was negative N because the coordinate system is flipped, right? Exactly. So yeah. notice, okay. the, yeah, yeah, I'll summarize that in a minute. You're absolutely right. He said it's negative N because the coordinate system is upside down now. So now down is positive J hat. And I know that seems silly, but like I said, we're trying to get used to doing things in weird ways so that we can handle circular motion eventually. So, yep. Are people getting this equation or is this making sense or are there any questions about it? It's okay if there are just, we've got time. So if you have questions, ask. All right. So if I started too soon, just interrupt me. But that said, I want to point out, isn't this exactly the same as the last problem? The support force in this case is it's a normal force from the scale lifting up. And so this is the support force is equal to the weight minus the mass times the magnitude of the acceleration. Let's look at this again one last time. The fact is, you get the same result. Here, there was a tension upwards. Whoops. Uh, let me make this a little bigger. Hold on. 
needs a fluid. Come on, computer. So in this problem, oh, oh man, it's so slow on Zoom. Sorry. Ah, ah. Sorry, I got a, so many Zoom factors you got to deal with. And let me do this. In this problem, there was a tension up. In this problem, there's a normal force up. So in this case, it was a tension pulling it up. In this case, it was a normal force holding it up. But in either case, it's an upwards force that's supporting it. And let's see what the chat was there. Oh my gosh, everybody's gonna love in the classroom so much, right? Yeah. That said, um, this is what's crazy about it. We get the same equation. In one case, the coordinate system was this way. In the other case, the coordinate system is that way. We get the same answers regardless of the coordinate system. Said another way, ah, this equation will turn out the same if you had drawn your coordinates the other way. Think about it. If you had flipped this, this would be positive, this would be negative, this would be negative. And this is a fundamental property of physics. The coordinate system you choose should not affect the magnitudes of your answers. It might affect the directions in the initial equations, which is the minus sign, but it shouldn't affect the magnitudes. That's why we're so often going to talk about the magnitudes of the forces instead of the vectors, because the vectors depend on how people choose their coordinate system. Said another way, when you look at this page that I wrote, uh, all of these things, the reason I choose the magnitudes is because that's what's going to be physically meaningful. The magnitudes are going to be the same between two students, regardless of how student A draws their coordinate system and student B. So all students should get the same results for these force magnitudes in the end. In fact, this this concept is pretty fundamental. There were two postulates to Einstein's theory of special relativity. I can't believe I'm bringing this up twice in one class period. But yes, one of the postulates is nothing can move faster than the speed of light. The other is the coordinate system shouldn't matter. It's such a big deal. Those were the only two things he started with. And from that, he came up with relativity. Isn't that crazy? So that's, that's a fundamental, fundamental property of physics is your coordinate system shouldn't matter to the physics, the underlying physics. It might affect some signs here or there, but not the, the fundamental meaning of problems. Um, all right, uh, questions on that. Okay, so, um, so the equation will stay the same, but let's say that the acceleration is going up instead. Uh, that would be so while different. It's, while it's, it? Yeah. So while it's going down, the scale is going to show the normal force, right? But if it's going up, it's going to show mg. Is that no? My... The scale always shows the normal force. The weight is always mg, and the scale reading always relates to both the weight and the acceleration, whether it's up or down. Okay. Is that good? Let me, let me say that one more time, just in case with computer lag and stuff. The normal force, by definition, is the supporting force. It might not be sufficient to support the whole weight. It might be more than enough so that the object accelerates in some different way. The fact is, N is the force from the floor or the scale or whatever you're standing on. That's always true. Okay. The weight is always related to your mass and G of the planet that you are on. So on Earth, G is 9.8. On the moon, it's 9.8 divided by about 6. Okay, so the weight is always this. Now, the normal force will change depending on what acceleration you have. Or you could view it as the acceleration changes depending on what normal force you have. In an elevator, if your normal force is greater than your weight, you accelerate upwards. If it's less than your weight, you're accelerating downwards. If it's equal to your weight, 
you're either not moving or moving with constant speed up or down. Is that good? Yeah. Okay. Heavy. Heavy, heavy, right? So we have to break our habits of thinking that A and G are interchangeable. A and G are not the same thing. Most problems, there's some other force. A is not equal to G. All right. Good stuff. Other questions? That, that's tricky. What do you think? I think at this point, let, let's see. Uh, I think we've covered everything, but... Oh, let's take a look here. Let's just do one more. Let's see if this makes sense to you now. Let me see. I'm going to, uh, so we're pretty much done. This is now uh, icing on the cake. Give me a second here. Oh, uh, let me see what I want to do here. Let's look at this one here. Um, actually, let's start with a simpler one. Okay, so this, uh, this is probably going to be too tough for you. All right, let's go back. Sorry. Let's start with um, this one. Okay, so I, I know, and so if you don't understand this, this is okay. I'm just going to try something to give you a vision of why we would care about this stuff, okay? So let's say you have a 35-degree angle. And then to do things in computer coding, I need to change that to radians. Now, these are going to be coefficients of friction. And what I could do, if we want to do a frictionless problem, I could just come into here and set these numbers to zero, okay? So now there's no friction, okay? Now, G, that's just a number, 9.8 meters per second. Let's say I have a one kilogram mass. This is just to draw some stuff. This is just to draw some stuff. This is just to draw some stuff. Now notice right here, this says, I'm gonna put the block, which is an object, it's a box at some position. Let's run this program. Maybe today. Whoa, oh, oh no, my computer, hug up, there it is. So here's the idea is we want to understand that. Oh, I need some sig fig corrections there, but whatever. Let's look in this program. So we're trying to use these forces to understand motion, right? So the block starts out basically halfway up the incline or something like that. Now, initially the block's velocity is zero. And then I rotate the incline, the block, blah, 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 blah. Now look at this force vector. See if this part makes sense to you. Again, this is icing on the cake. If you want to leave, take off. If you're not a coding type of person, leave and just call it a day. Okay, quiz on Monday, everybody. Quiz on Monday. That said, look at this vector. That's mg in the negative j hat, right? Mass times g in the negative j hat. That's the force vector. Okay, let's keep going down here. The normal force vector, we're going to to learn is some complicated thing that relates on mass g and some cosine of an angle. Okay, blah, 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 blah. There's the normal force. Okay, forget all this stuff. That's just friction. But look at this. The net force is going to be the normal force plus the weight force plus the friction force, which for us is going to be zero. The acceleration would be the net force divided by the mass. Now, all this stuff is cosmetics, cosmetics label. And then what I do is I pick a small amount of time. And the idea is the block velocity is basically take the acceleration times the change in time. That's uh, plus equals means update it or add. I'm adding acceleration times dt. So what does that mean? In this equation, remember we said force, uh, the net force is equal to mass times uh delta V over delta T. So what I'm doing right there is I'm saying, oh, the, the change in velocity is force net over mass times the change in time. Okay, that's what that code is doing. So if you wanted to see this in action, 
That's, uh, and remember the acceleration, if you recall, was F net over mass. So, and then that's how I chose the code. And then all I'm doing is I'm just saying, okay, each time update the velocity, and then you update the position, and then you recompute. And when you do that, you get this cheesy little code that takes forever to load because we're on Zoom. Give it a minute. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm basically doing exactly what I said early in the program to make this work. And the sig figs, well, who cares about that right now? All right, so let's, let's end that there. But that's the idea of eventually you could actually use this to do something useful.